Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our Insolvency Junior Programme webinar. I'm joined here by my colleague Matthew Mills. He's going to take you through some recent cases that have been handed down during lockdown and in the process he's going to consider the in, like, limits to insolvency law. <coughs> so um, before we start with that, um, I'm going to look at the Bresco decision that has been handed down by the Supreme Court. So um, the Bresco decision is really a seminal, um, really important ruling in insolvency law. What it does is it shows that companies in administration and in liquidation um, can refer a construction dispute to adjudication even where there are competing claims. So even though the insolvency set of rules apply, that will not prevent the adjudicator from having jurisdiction and will allow the uh, proceedings to continue. Brilliant. Um, so yes, yeah, so Bresco really is a, a landmark uh, decision. Um, what we're going to do is look at the, the facts and why there was some confusion at the beginning as to whether the construction adjudicator had jurisdiction to hear the dispute. Um, we're then going to consider the decision itself and touch on the decisions of the lower courts, so um, in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal. And we're then going to consider the impact of that decision. So if we start then with the facts, uh, they're fairly straightforward. Uh, Bresco entered into a contract with Longsdale to perform some electrical works uh, at a London site. That was a sub subcontract, but um, we'll just refer to it as the contract. Uh, the Housing Grants and Construction Regeneration Act applied to that contract. That is the act which effectively brought into play the statutory adjudication procedure. Section 108 of that statute provides that a party to a construction contract has the right to refer a dispute arising, importantly, out of the contract for adjudication. And there was, as is commonly the case now, an express term in the contract to that effect. So both parties had a statutory and a contractual right to refer a dispute to adjudication. It's worth just touching on the benefits um, of obtaining adjudication uh, decisions. They are rarely challenged in practice. And whilst they are interim, um, they can be formalized by virtue of an agreement, uh, by litigation, or if available, uh, by arbitration. And they're a very speedy way of resolving a dispute. So the statute provides that from 28 days from the date of referral, uh, the adjudicator has to resolve that dispute unless it's extended. So it's clearly a benefit for the purposes of enforcing payments to have the decision adjudicated. So in this case, uh, Bresco uh, was slightly disgruntled with the way things were going on and left the site in December 2014. Each party uh, alleged that the other had repudiated uh, the agreement and uh, subsequently Bresco entered into CVL uh, the following year. Longsdale uh, intimated a claim for costs for completing the works, uh, that is having employed a contractor to finish off uh, the works that Bresco had started. And three years later, Bresco referred the dispute to adjudication. Lonsdale then argued that the adjudicator had no jurisdiction to hear uh, the dispute, alleging that the competing claims between the parties gave rise to the insolvency uh, rule on set off, uh, that is rule 14.25 uh, that applies in liquidation, such that the underlying claims uh, no longer existed and therefore there was no dispute in the contract at least for the adjudicator to determine. The adjudicator disagreed and that caused Lonsdale to issue part eight proceedings to seek effectively a permanent injunction presenting, um, preventing these adjudication proceedings continuing. The rule is up there for you on the slide. So 14.25, um, it provides that where a company goes into a liquidation and there have been mutual dealings between the company and a creditor of the company. So that's very widely uh, drafted mutual dealings. 
uh, proving or claiming to prove for a debt in uh, liquidation, an account must be taken. So it's a mandatory set off uh, provision that's provided for here. And if there is a balance owing to the creditor, then that is the only balance that's able uh, to be proved. And similarly, if a balance is owed to the company, then it is that sum uh, that must be paid to the liquidator. Um, for administration, uh, the provision is 14.24, and there is a similar provision, section 323, in the case of bankruptcy. Now, the reason for um, this uh, provision is fairly obvious. If a creditor is also a debtor, it would be very unfair for the debtor to have to prove in uh, an, an insolvent liquidation or an administration and potentially only get a portion of their debt, um, whereas on the other hand, the company would be able to, but for this provision, um, enforce its debt in full. So it provides security uh, for that debtor. Now, the reason why there was some confusion as to the jurisdiction um, of the adjudicator in cases where insolvency setup applied was largely um, contributed to by the speech of Lord Hoffman in the case of Stein and Blake. And in that case, the court was tasked with determining whether a trustee in bankruptcy could assign a, a cause of action back to the bankrupt where insolvency setup applied. So the question was whether the insolvency uh, set off provision effectively extinguished the underlying claims such that assignment of them was impossible. And uh, Lord Hoffman was very clear in his uh, conclusion. Uh, at first, he said the conclusion must be that the original shows in action ceases to exist and is replaced by a claim to a net balance. However, and as we'll see, this is significant when we get to Lord Briggs's uh, judgment in the Supreme Court decision. He did say that cross claims must obviously be considered separately for the purpose of ascertaining the balance. Now, for that purpose, they are treated as if they continue to exist. Now, his judgment does continue um, to go on to uh, quite emphatically put that uh, the underlying shows of action are um, extinguished, but he does contemplate here that there is, uh, for some purposes at least, an exception. So then that takes us to the Bresco um, decision, as we've seen, um, Longsdale was seeking an injunction to prevent the adjudication proceedings and we get to the High Court and Mr Justice Fraser um, was tasked with deciding the issue. And he found that as at the date of uh, the liquidation, by virtue of 14.25, uh, the disputes between the two parties um, were effectively replaced by a single debt. Now, when you read the judgment, he, steamed, he seems to stop short of saying that the underlying claims are extinguished, uh, but he does say that they were replaced by single debt and therefore they were not enforceable um, by themselves. So the effect of that judgment is um, to show that they were extinguished, in, in my view. Um, as he also uh, notes, the underlying claims then were not uh, capable of separate enforcement. And on that basis, he gave a declaration to the effect that the adjudicator had no jurisdiction. He also found there was no utility in allowing the adjudication proceedings to continue because they wouldn't be able um, to conclude in uh, an enforcement of uh, the decision. Um, so then this went to the Court of Appeal. Uh, Bresco obviously not happy with that uh, decision and Lord Justice Colson gave the uh, leading uh, judgment. He found that uh, the adjudicator had um, jurisdiction, albeit technically, um, because the underlying claims did exist and uh, to the extent that he had suggested uh, otherwise in a, a different judgment, he established that he was wrong. Um, it was uh, obviously conceded in that case by Longsdale that the right to refer uh, the dispute to arbitration or litigate the matter at court uh, would remain and that was quite a significant concession. Um, however, he favoured um, Mr Justice Fraser's conclusion that it would still be futile uh, for the matter to proceed to adjudication because enforcement would effectively deprive um, the uh, parties of uh, the security. It would effectively circumvent the purpose of section 14.25 uh, and therefore um, wouldn't uh, be available. 
in that case there was no point in allowing the adjudication to uh, continue. He also was quite um, clear that um, in, his, in his view adjudication and insolvency uh, were incompatible and uh, whilst Longsdale suggested that there was some benefit um, provided by adjudication um, in relation to the ability to assess to quantify um, claims he found that uh, this was not the case uh, so he concluded that adjudication was futile and the injunction restraining uh, the adjudication was maintained so then we get to uh, the supreme court decision um, and in this um, instance lord briggs gave the single uh, judgment the other justices all agreed um, and he started with the issue of jurisdiction noting that what we have to do is construe the relevant provision and the the contract uh, term as well and he rejected an argument from Lonsdale that the phrase there before you any dispute arising under the contract uh, should be narrowly construed he, he couldn't find any reason compelling him uh, to do so um, and he also found that a single dispute rule argument that was um, levelled by Longsdale was also misconceived. Um, in that instance, Longsdale had said that, in short, an adjudicator was only able to resolve one dispute, and either there were more than one uh, disputes because there was a claim and cross claim, in which case the adjudicator had no jurisdiction, or there was one claim for the net balance, in which case that arose under the insolvency um, by virtue of 14.25 and not under the contract. Um, the judge wasn't impressed with that. He said that there was no such rule expressly as a matter of jurisdiction under the Act or under the scheme. And uh, without making a determination on this point clearly, as it was not necessary for his judgment, uh, he seems to take the view that uh, the cross claim relied on as um, a set off defence would invariably join the, the claim dispute. So we'd be looking at one single dispute anyway. Um, he found that the underlying claims were not extinguished. Um, he thought that Lonsdale relied on over literal reading of Lord Hoffman's speech in Stein and Blake. And as we've seen, um, whilst that case did expressly say that the shows of action underneath were um, extinguished, he did uh, expressly note um, that for the purposes of uh, quantification, at least they would still uh, remain live. And in support of uh, this conclusion, Lord Briggs uh, noted that various other um, elements support um, what he found, for instance, uh, as to security rights, they continue uh, to exist as well. Um, he expressly disagreed with um, the Court of Appeal, with Lord Justice Coulson. He didn't find that um, construction adjudication was in any way incompatible with the operation of the insolvency code in general. And in fact, he found that there was a lot of similarities in the way in which one can prove for a debt um, in liquidation or in any insolvency process and the speedy way in which one can have uh, a dispute resolved by adjudication. Um, and he was quite emphatic about that. Um, he found as well that there was no reason why um, adjudication should be any different to arbitration. If one can refer a dispute to arbitration then similarly uh, we should be able to benefit from the adjudication procedure as well. So once he had finished with um, the adjudication, uh, the jurisdiction arguments, he moved to the issue of futility and found that as a starting point, you have to consider that if there is jurisdiction, it would ordinarily be entirely inappropriate for the court to interfere with the exercise of that statutory and contractual right. He found that it was simply wrong to suggest that the only purpose of construction adjudication is to enable a party to obtain summary enforcement, a speedy payment, uh, although that is um, clearly a, a benefit and an important purpose. Um, he found that adjudication uh, being a mainstream method of ADR uh, now, um, it led to speedy, cost-effective and final resolution of most of the many disputes that are referred to it and uh, dispute resolution is therefore an end in its own right, even where summary of enforcement may not be appropriate or unavailable. So he clearly identified the utility to adjudication, putting um, enforcement aside. He also um, remarked that adjudicators will often be better positioned 
to resolve these sorts of um, disputes being construction specialists um, and most liquidators will not have uh, the requisite expertise. So uh, adjudication really does uh, provide a helpful mechanism for dispute resolution for office holders. Um, Lord Briggs identified that there would be some cases where summary enforcement would also be appropriate. For instance, if the uh, cross claim was accepted or if it was without substance, then it would be quite easy for uh, the courts to deal with it and um, enforce the judgment. Um, there were various concerns that were raised by Lonsdale um, in this case. One of them was uh, the risk that an adjudicator could overvalue uh, the net balance in the company's favour uh, and then leave the respondent to have to prove uh, in an underfunded liquidation. Now, Lord Briggs thought that this, uh, whilst a, um, a sensible concern, was not a new problem. And of course, we see that it often is the case that uh, there can be disputes in um, insolvency processes about whether um, claims have been properly valued. And he thought that uh, this could be an issue that would be dealt at the enforcement stage. And certainly, if the respondent had a good case that the uh, decision had overvalued uh, the company's claim, um, that would be a very good reason to refuse summary judgment um, in respect of the decision. As to uh, the concerns about the cost of adjudication and the burden on the respondent having to meet um, those, uh, Lord Briggs found that, that of itself was not a reason to prevent uh, the adjudication continuing and also noted that as um, office holders will be aware there is a provision um, which provides that ADR expenses would in any event be covered um, as an expense in the liquidation. Now of course that isn't a guarantee of payment uh, but it is some reassurance at least and as to whether a respondent um, would be prejudiced by having to meet the costs of overturning um, an adjudication decision should it be enforced. Well, all of those issues can be dealt with at the enforcement stage, as uh, was discussed in the Meadowside case, uh, which again is up there on the slide for you, to which uh, Lord Briggs referred. Uh, another concern uh, that was flagged by Lonsdale was the costs and burden on the courts um, that might um, result from um, a decision to find that adjudication would uh, not be futile. Um, Lord Briggs found the opposite. He thought that actually allowing um, the state of affairs to continue, uh, which would lead to more uh, costly injunctions, was actually less desirable. And he compared this to the fact that adjudications are quick and less costly and can assist liquidators. So he thought um, this result would actually provide less of a burden. Um, for the courts. So what then does this mean in practice? Well as we've noted at the outset it's a really positive um, judgment for office holders. It shows that companies in liquidation and administration can refer disputes to adjudication uh, in the knowledge that they can proceed to adjudication and they will not be met by uh, injunction proceedings in a uh, majority of cases, um, even where set off rules apply. It might uh, lead to an increase in adjudications uh, by insolvent companies, which of course uh, is no bad thing considering uh, the current pandemic that we are experiencing. Uh, certainly a lot of office holders will want to resolve uh, disputes speedily. Um, it may even increase the number of funding and assignment arrangements whereby third parties uh, take on claims that are suitable for adjudication. Um, Lord Briggs's uh, judgment can be read as a, a clear encouragement to use a range of disputes uh, mechanisms, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms um, for office holders. Could this lead to a piecemeal approach to resolution? That's to be seen. Um, but of course, one key um, concern that still um, is live is the issue of enforcement. Now, it might be that this case encourages um, adjudications, but parties certainly will want to um, consider whether they'll be able to enforce their decision um, at the end of the day, notwithstanding the utility adjudication offers um, enforcement aside. And to that um, extent, we have to um, be aware of the Meadowside um, case, which Lord Briggs himself referred to. In that case, um, the judge refused to enforce 
um, the adjudication decision, even though it dealt with the mutual dealings of the parties. Um, he was not satisfied with the security uh, that was put forward um, by the insolvent company. Now, it's important to note that this case was decided after um, Lord Justice Colson's um, judgment, after the Court of Appeal decision, but before the Supreme Court decision. And in that case, the judge um, expressly referred to Lord Justice Colson's finding that, um, or view, uh, that there was a fundamental incompatibility of the adjudication process and the insolvency regime. Um, it was put in that case that enforcement by way of sub, uh, summary judgment is exceptional and is uh, likely to, or more likely to occur, where the adjudication determines the net position and so mirrors uh, the regime under 14.25 and whether there is uh, satisfactory security will also be a significantly influential factor. Um, security for uh, not only the adjudication itself, so to ring fence uh, the enforced award, but also uh, security for the respondent's costs in having to deal with any unsuccessful application to enforce and any subsequent litigation or, if it's available, arbitration to overturn the adjudication decision in question. And that case also said that these safeguards must seek to uh, place the respondent in a similar position uh, as it would have been in if the company in issue was solvent. Um, and various security options were highlighted, uh, including uh, ring fencing, as uh, I've already identified, uh, providing a third party guarantee and AT assurance. Now, they may be for um, many uh, fairly complicated arrangements to enter into at short notice, whether these will um, still be required considering the, the case was uh, determined before the Supreme Court decision uh, remains to be seen and whether they will effectively um, dissuade people from uh, using the adju adjudication process is also uh, to be seen. But for the um, large part, uh, this judgment is a very welcomed one for office holders. Um, now, I'm going to pass to Matthew, um, who's going to uh, give you his talk and then... Brilliant. Well, thanks very much. When I was trying to come up with a, talk, a title for this talk, I had a quick flick through the 31 reported insolvency judgments that have been handed down since lockdown began. And what I found is that in two thirds of the cases, the court was not allowing an insolvency to either keep going or to extend in reach or even to begin. But what really sold this topic to me was the fact that I could get not just one, but two examples of alliteration in the title, the limits of the law and COVID cases. However, this is a risky strategy. The limits of the law is also the name of a recent book that's been published to assess the contribution of Lord Sumption to the law. Unfortunately, this draws two things to your attention, my far inferior contribution to the law and my far inferior hair. But with those insights about my title out of the way, what am I actually going to be talking about? I'm going to cover four issues from the recent cases. Firstly, inhibiting the inception of insolvency. Second, the effects of extraterritoriality. Thirdly, abortive applications. And fourthly, the termination of administration. I think I went a bit trigger happy on the alliteration. Our first and main topic, though, is the inception of insolvency. Now, before I get stuck in, I should say I'm not going to talk in detail about the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020. From a quick Google, it seems that the world and his dog has written a blog post about this, featuring a fairly lame stock photo. Instead, what I'm going to talk about is the case law. I'm going to cover four issues relating to the inception of insolvency. Restraining winding up petitions, restoring companies to the register, appointing administrators and disputing bankruptcy petitions. As you probably no doubt know, paragraph two of schedule 10 of the new 2020 Act states that until the end of September, a creditor can only present a winding up petition if they have reasonable grounds for believing one of two things. Either coronavirus has not had a financial effect on the company, or the relevant events would have arisen in any event, even if coronavirus had not had that financial impact. But even if the petitioner can get through those hurdles and present a petition, there's a further hurdle to getting a winding up order. Now there's quite a bit of text here, but I'll break it down. If it appears to the court that coronavirus had a financial effect on the company 
before presentation. That's the first quote. Then the court will only award a winding up order if it is satisfied, and this is the last quote, that the relevant facts would have arisen even if coronavirus hadn't had an impact. And that's a lot of negatives and double negatives, but in a nutshell, if there's a financial impact on the company due to coronavirus, you can only get a winding up order if the company would have been insolvent in any event. The leading judgment on these paragraphs is a Radcliffe Chambers case. Our friend and colleague Lauren Creamer appeared in Rear Company a few weeks ago. In that case, ICC Judge Barber analysed the provisions I've just described, and in my view gave seven important tips. Firstly, the limits on the presentation of petitions apply regardless of the date of the statutory demand. All that matters is the date of presentation of the petition. Secondly, in reality, few petitioners are going to be able to prove that coronavirus has had no adverse financial impact, unless you're very boldly trying to wind up Tesco. In re reality, then, in most cases, petitioners will need to persuade a court that the company would have been insolvent in any case. Three. Once a petition has been validly presented, it's then up to the company for the second limb to prove that it was financially affected by COVID. However, fourthly, and this is the important point, this is clearly intended to be a low threshold. The requirement is simply that there is a financial effect. It's not a requirement for the cause or even a cause. All the company needs to prove is a prima facie case. Fifthly, once that threshold has been passed by the company, then to get a winding up order, the petitioner must show that the company would have been insolvent in any event. But sixthly, if we're talking about an application to restrain advertisement of a petition, then the petitioner at that stage only needs to show that there's a real chance of a winding up order being made. And seventhly, even if everything goes against the petitioner, the court may add a provision in the order giving liberty to apply to the petitioner to come back later with more evidence as to the company's financial position. In other words, they may get a second bite of the cherry, as happened in that case. Judge Barber's judgment is also useful because it's another example of courts applying law that's not yet in force. So at the time of the judgment, the Corporate Insolvency Act was still just a bill. But Judge Barber nonetheless applied it as if it was a past legislation. That's because she had a high degree of confidence that the Act would be passed in more or less its current form. Those were her words. This was very similar to what Mr Justice Morgan had done a few weeks earlier in another rear company case. But the most interesting example of this recently is the Travel Lodge case. You may have heard of this because in that case Mr Justice Burrs relied on the government's press releases about the upcoming restrictions on insolvency. That's pretty remarkable because there wasn't any bill, there wasn't any white paper, he was simply relying on basically two paragraphs of text from the government website, but that was enough in his view to apply to the case. Now that's quite specific on its facts, but it might be useful for your clients going forwards if the government announces changes that have not yet come into force, you could try and use the Travel Lodge case to say that the court should still take those things into account in the current fast moving climate. In the St. Benedict's Land Trust case, Mr. Justice Snowden reminded us of another important limit on insolvency law, standing. In that case, a director shareholder herself applied to restrain presentation of a winding up petition against her company. Now there are various flaws with her application, but the one key question was whether she, as the director shareholder, could bring the application in her own name. Mr. Justice Snowden said no, and he gave two principal reasons. Firstly, Rule 7.24, which is the rule that talked about these applications, refers to an application by a company, not by anybody else. But secondly, and more specifically, the legal right that this process is designed to protect is the right of the company not to be unfairly subjected to insolvency procedures. That's the company's right, not the right of any director or shareholder. However, Mr Justice Snowden did acknowledge that in exceptional circumstances, it may be possible for a director shareholder to bring a derivative application for an injunction. The one good example of this is the old case of Manor Goldstein that Mr Justice Snowden discussed. But do remember, even in that case, the derivative action is still being brought essentially on behalf of the company. It's not really being brought in the name of the director shareholder in the truest sense of the word. So it's not really an exception to this limit on insolvency law. <laughs> 
Radcliffe Chambers' Tina Kiriakides was involved in another useful recent case, this time on restoring a company to the register. As you may know, Section 1029.2 of the Companies Act basically provides a long list of people who can apply to restore a company to the register. And it concludes with the words on the slide, or any other person appearing to the court to have an interest in the matter. In BCB Environmental Management, ICC Judge Barber interpreted that section. And she set out her conclusions at quite great length in these paragraphs. Now, you don't really need to read them because the upshot is there is no real guidance on what those phrases mean, except you cannot simply be curious. Well, great. We get a little bit more guidance from the facts of the case itself, though. In that case, the people who were applying were liquidators of other companies related to the dissolved companies. And those liquidators had used public documents to basically work out that there might have been wrongful antecedent transactions made by the dissolved companies. But Judge Barber said that wasn't enough of an interest. Judge Barber said those liquidators were in no different position to any other liquidator who might be appointed when the dissolved companies were restored. And it didn't matter that HMRC had consented to the liquidators bearing the costs of this process. Now that's a fairly fact-specific conclusion, but Judge Barber did usefully remind us that paragraphs 26 and 27, that if you want to bring an application to restore a company, you need to make sure that you address the issue of standing in the written witness evidence. And if you're doing it based on section 1092 and the words on that slide, you should probably try and tailor it to the words in the BCB judgment. His Honour Judge Halliwell, sitting as a High Court judge in Manchester, has recently given us a useful decision on the appointment of administrators in the Secure Mortgage Corp case. Now, in 1998, Secure Mortgage Corp had granted a qualifying floating charge to the Lancashire Mortgage Company. In 1999, the company was struck off the register. Nothing happened for 20 years, but in 2019, the company was restored and the estate of Mr. Peter Nolan claimed that he was the assignee of that charge that had been granted to Lancashire, Mor Lancashire Mortgage Corp and he purported to appoint administrators. The company challenged this. The judge held that the appointment was void. Although a qualifying floating charge holder's right to appoint an administrator does pass on their death to their executors, in this case, the executors had simply not proved that Mr. Nolan was ever entitled to make the appointment. To put it bluntly, they provided no documents at all to show that he was the assignee of the charge from the Lancashire Mortgage Company. In fact, the charges registered last showed a BVI company that was now dissolved as the last charge holder. So the obvious point for clients is make sure you address the documents you need in your evidence to prove that you have the right to make the appointment. But the most useful thing about this case is probably tucked away in paragraph 34. The notice of appointment form had the words, the estate of the late Mr. Peter Nolan in the box talking about who was making the appointment. The judge held that this did not satisfy the requirements in paragraph 18 of Schedule B1 because it wasn't the name of a person. In those circumstances then, by paragraph 19, the notice simply wouldn't have taken effect anyway, even if the executors had managed to prove that Mr Nolan had the rights of the charge. So the real takeaway from this point is make sure you fill in the administration appointment forms very, very carefully. The final topic on the inception of insolvency is disputing bankruptcy petitions. And there have been two recent reported cases. In Reed Jones, Mr. Justice Snowden set aside a statutory demand on the catch-all ground in Rule 10.55. And that is, the court is satisfied on other grounds that the demand ought to be set aside. Now, the facts of this case were pretty simple. Mr. Jones and Mr. Schofield were the directors and shareholders of the company. They paid themselves a monthly salary and monthly loans, and those loans were then repaid at the end of the year by the dividends. In typical form, the directors fell out and Mr Schofield excluded Mr Jones, and they started to bicker about the legal consequences. Mr Schofield's claim originally was for damages for the unpaid director's loan account. Mr Jones's response was to allege unfair prejudice. As soon as he did that, though, Mr Schofield decided to present a statutory demand. The question was, should that statutory demand be set aside? 
Now, Mr. Jones raised various arguments, but the most interesting one concerns 10.55. Mr. Justice Snowden, in this quite bulky text, basically said the only coherent explanation of what Mr. Schofield done was he was trying to stop Mr. Jones from bringing the unfair prejudice petition by making him go bankrupt. Now, that was obviously an abuse of process and unjust, so the statutory demand would obviously be set aside. Now, the takeaway from this is the well-known mantra, don't use the insolvency process to just defraud other people out of their rights. I'm sure you wouldn't have done that anyway, but it's a useful reminder. The last case on the inception of insolvency is Reshaw, that was decided on the 5th of May in the Liverpool County Court by District Judge Samantha Johnson. Now, as you know, county court judgments are not authoritative, but this appears to be the only reported judgment on this specific point, so it's worth bearing in mind. Mr. Shaw applied online to the adjudicator to make himself bankrupt. He had debts of about 170 grand, but his pension pot was about 460 grand, and the adjudicator refused to make him bankrupt on the basis that as he was 64, he could draw down a lump sum from that pension pot and pay off all his debts in full. Mr. Shaw appealed that decision to the county court. And the question for the court was, can the pension pot be taken into account when deciding whether someone is unable to pay their debts? District Judge Johnson held that the answer is no. She gave both practical and policy reasons for it. Practically, she said that drawing down a pension is quite a lengthy process that's very different to simply withdrawing money from, say, a savings account. To use the language of the case law, it's not a means of visible support in the near future. In other words, the money is not readily accessible. But there are also sound policy arguments for this. Importantly, people should be encouraged to save for their retirement, and those funds should only be taken away from them and the ring fence broken in cases of fraud. There was no evidence of this here. So unusually, this limit on insolvency law actually makes it easier to bankrupt someone. But in my view, it's a very sensible and fair decision. All right, let's now turn to our second topic of the day, extraterritoriality. Two recent cases have reminded us of the limits of the English insolvency law, where there's an international element. But before I get to them, here is a picture of a truck. It has nothing to do with anything I'm going to be talking to you about, but bizarrely, this is the first image that comes up when you search international in the PowerPoint stock image database. Don't know what's going on there. Anyway, the first of our two cases is re-accurate. In this case, we were given yet another authority on the extraterritoriality of Section 236 of the Insolvency Act. I've put it on the slide, but in a nutshell, 2363 allows the court to make an order requiring various people to provide an account of their dealings to the company or produce any relevant paperwork. The question is, can this apply to people outside of the jurisdiction? The Chancellor held that the answer is no. However, if the insolvency regulation applies, for example, if the insolvent company's centre of main interest is in England, then the courts do have the power to make an order against someone in an EU member state. Now, while this has clarified the law for now, there are two important caveats to it. Firstly, the impending spectre of Brexit may undermine the usefulness of the second part of this decision. But secondly, at paragraph 53, Voss was clearly very unhappy with the law that he felt obliged to follow at paragraph one, but he said it was up to the Court of Appeal to change it. Given those fairly strong remarks from the Chancellor, it's likely that someone's going to bring a Court of Appeal case on this relatively soon, but for the purposes of this talk, the law is settled. You cannot use section 2363 to order people outside of the EU to provide office holders with information or paperwork. Our second extraterritoriality case is Islands Banking in Stanford. This concerns the enforcement of foreign judgments. Section 2681B of the Insolvency Act says a person is deemed to be unable to pay their debts, in a nutshell, if execution of a judgment returns unsatisfied. In this case, the bank had obtained an Icelandic judgment worth about 1.5 million against Mr. Stanford. Excuse me. They'd registered that judgment in England pursuant to the Lugano Convention. Articles 43 and 47 of that convention state that you have to wait a month after registering a foreign judgment before enforcing it, because that gives time for the debtor to challenge registration. But in this case, the bank just ploughed on 
One week after registering the judgment, they secured a writ of control from the High Court to take control of Mr. Stanford's goods. And although they apparently secured a number of Ferraris this way, this didn't pay off the full debt. So the bank, bank presented a petition. The Court of Appeal unanimously upheld all the judgments below, dismissing the petition. The convention is clear. No enforcement measures may be brought until one month after registration. In other words, it's simply impermissible as a matter of law to try and enforce that judgment for a month. And if you try to do so, it's not proper enforcement for the purposes of Section 2681. In other words, the defect is fundamental. So while you might think that waiting a month is simply a procedural point, the Court of Appeal has told us this is actually a formal, important, substantive limit. So if your client is intending to rely on 2681B and a foreign judgment, make sure they comply with the process for registering that judgment before ploughing on with a petition. I'll now talk to you briefly about three recent cases which show the limits of insolvency applications in ongoing insolvency proceedings. This is not one of those applications. It is, however, an application from 1897 made by Mr. Frank Crocker, owner of the Crocker's Folly in Kilburn, London, for a license for music and dancing. If only applications were that short, eh? Our first real application, though, concerns Section 234 of the Insolvency Act. In a nutshell, this allows an office holder to apply to the court for an order that a person must deliver any property, books or papers to which the company appears to be entitled. One of the key issues for the Court of Appeal in Ezer and Com was what types of claims can be covered by this section. In a nutshell, the Court of Appeal held that Section 234 is intended to be a summary procedure to assist an office holder with the insolvency process. It's not designed to definitively determine questions of title. So, for example, you cannot use Section 234 to determine questions of the title claimed by third parties or to bring specific performance applications on behalf of the company or to claim damages in lieu of specific performance on behalf of the company. In short, this is not about resolving disputes. It's simply about effectively the administration of insolvency applications. Our second insolvency application is yet another Adcliffe Chambers affair. It's the case of refolds in which our friend and colleague Andrew Brown appeared. In a nutshell, 16 months before a bankruptcy petition was presented against him, Mr. Folds paid just under 50 grand to his stepdaughter, Ms. Wilson. That 50 grand was held to be a preference. However, exceptionally, ICC Judge Jones refused to order any restitution in this case, and he gave four principal reasons. Firstly, this was an arm's length commercial transaction in which Ms. Wilson provided a fair amount of work for litigation that Mr. Fold was taking part in. Secondly, Ms. Wilson had played no part in deciding to make the preference. She'd simply received the money in good faith. Thirdly, Ms. Wilson no longer had the money or any realizable assets to repay it. What she'd done with the money is pay her biological father back for money he'd lent her and he had in turn used that money to pay for the cancer treatment of his wife. Fourthly, Ms. Wilson would have to sell her house to repay the 50 grand, which the judge thought would be wholly disproportionate on the facts. Now, although the trial judge did his best to emphasize that this was a rare case, in reality, it's likely that respondents to antecedent transaction claims would be relying on this authority in future to try and limit the scope of the insolvency law provisions. Our final insolvency application is actually from an unreported judgment, but in my view, it's still useful. On the 7th of April 2020, ICC Judge Burton gave an extempore judgment in the wonderfully named Hunt and Down. In that case, a firm of insolvency practitioners called Triap was wound up. Between presentation and winding up, Triap had transferred its business and assets to a new company for no consideration. The liquidators of Triap brought a block transfer application basically asking to remove the liquidators, sorry, the directors of Triap from their office in respect of their clients. So in other words, the liquidators of Triap also wanted to be appointed as the liquidators of Triap's clients. The liquidators said this was necessary because the IPs from Triap were not fit to hold office. They transferred all their assets for no money to avoid the effects of liquidation. And there was an argument they'd misappropriated some of their clients' funds anyway. These are pretty powerful reasons to remove an IP, you might think. But 
Judge Burton refused the order. And she did this for essentially two reasons. Firstly, we've got our old friend standing. The liquidators of TRIAP didn't have standing to bring an application with respect to these client companies because the liquidators weren't creditors of those companies and the liquidators weren't the professional regulators of the IPs. But secondly, in reality, this was a hostile application that should have been dealt with pursuant to Section 108 of the Insolvency Act with proper pleadings and evidence and a trial and not by the administrative block transfer process. So it's a warning of the limits of the block transfer process. My final topic of the webinar is the ending of administration. And yes, it's another Lehman Brothers case. The lawyers in Lehman Brothers have been making it rain for the last decade, but it seems that things are finally coming to a conclusion. In this case, Lehman Brothers Europe was put into administration in June 2012, but it then went into liquidation last November as it's approaching the completion of the insolvency process, amazingly, with a surplus. However, before the administration came to an end, the administrators forgot to ask the creditors' committee to approve their discharge from liability. And unfortunately for the administrators, the committee has now been automatically disbanded because the creditors have all been paid off. So the administrators applied to court for an order discharging them for liability six months down the line. Paragraph 98 of Schedule B1 provides the person is discharged from liability in respect of any action of his as administrator, effectively when he ceases to be an administrator. Curiously though, paragraph 98 does not specify who has standing to apply for discharge, and there was no reported judgment on this point. Nevertheless, Mr Justice Hildyard was content to decide that ex-administrators do have standing under paragraph 98 to bring an application. He was also content to backdate the discharge order to the onset of the liquidation last November. Now, the outcome was entirely unsurprising on the facts. In fact, this was decided on the papers with basically no opposition. But it's good to have this point clarified. But going forward, the most important paragraph of the judgment is probably paragraph 22.2. And that's where the judge said, any person with a sufficient interest in the matter of an administrator's discharge or of a former administrator's discharge has standing to make such an application. Now, who precisely will fall within the scope of that wording is anybody's guess, but at least we know the battle lines for the next limit on insolvency law. Now, I know this talk might have felt as long as the Lehman Brothers insolvency, but fortunately for you, that's where I propose to end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure to share our thoughts with you and we hope to see you soon once we're out of this um, really unusual phase of working. <laughs>